So greetings everyone and welcome to the 80th session of the online optom learning series OOLS. Let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Frank Eppergesi. Dr. Frank is the past head of an optometry school in the UK. He has also worked in independent practice as well as a corporate practice. Not only that, but he also owns his own practice for about 10 years now. He specializes in pediatric optometry, binocular vision, and low vision. He is also the past intern deputy head of a business school and a past professor in learning innovation. He is also the co-founder director of the iTools professional development platform and since March 2020, he has developed a community of over 430 eye specialists, which shares resources uh, from his experience of optometry field as an optometrist and educator from over 29 years. He has a doctorate in low vision reading rehabilitation, an MBA and a master's in education. With all these qualifications and all this knowledge, today Dr. Frank is going to talk to us about the five clinical tests which we can use uh, in performing ex eye examinations, which can help us to get to the most accurate eye test or refraction or eye examination for our patients. So uh, welcome Dr. Frank onto our platform. And just to add on, he's also author of some of the books which he'll be sharing with us. And those books are available on Amazon and we'll be sharing the links as we go throughout the session. Right. So uh, welcome, Dr. Frank, uh, to our platform. Th thank you very much for, for that welcome. Um, um, I'd like to get a copy of that welcome and um, send it to my mother, who thinks I've been wasting my time for the last the last 30 years. Um, no, thank you for that very generous welcome and congratulations for setting up 80 of these presentations. That, that's a marvellous achievement uh, and well done to you and your team. You, you, you should be very proud of that. So these are the five topics I'm going to cover um, today. Um, and these are, the, these are five areas that I found very useful in my own clinical practice, running my own practice. Um, we'll, we'll go through these one by one and we'll see that some of them are useful on pretty much every patient, whereas some of them are, are, will be useful on, on just some types of um, patients. Um, so I've listed them, them here. Uh, the ones with asterisks, you can find um, some more resource on Udemy if you want to access that. Um, and there are some videos on the iTools platform as well. But before I go into the first one, the Bruckner test, I think we're going to run another poll um, to get some information about um, the age of children that you are licensed to, to examine. So there's the poll. If you can um, answer, what is the youngest age of children you are allowed to examine? I'm aware that in some countries there are restrictions as to the age that um, I, I do, I do quite a lot of work in the Middle East as well. Um, and I think they have to, they can only see children who are older than eight. Majority of them say there is no age barrier, any age, about 59% of them and skewed between 14, eight, six and four, approximately same seven to 10% that kind of range. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Um, and what I what I would encourage, uh, I, I'm a great believer in this 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 line I, I, I picked up from the states many years ago. Um, you have to educate first, educate and then legislate. Um, so for those countries that are, um, are only allowed to examine older children, the best way to deal with that is to get your education in and, and show people that you know how to deal with young children. Uh, and once you've got that education, you can demonstrate that and hopefully the legislators will then give you the license to see children of any age. But, but that's very useful information uh, for me to have. Thank you. So I'm just going to move on now to the first topic, um, which is, there we go, the, the Bruckner test. Now, when I did my 
a degree in optometry school, my, my bachelor's degree in optometry school. No, no one mentioned this technique to me. Okay, it was, it was about 30 years ago now, but no one mentioned this technique. It was only when I went to the States in, uh, in about 95, 96, to my first conference, the American Academy of Optometry, that I heard people talking about this test. And I thought, well, this is a, this is a wonderful test. So when I became a lecturer at the op same optometry school where I did my degree, I introduced this test as part of the curriculum. Um, so at least the students who were coming out following, you know, from 2000 onwards would have some knowledge of this test. And it's a, it's a very simple and it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful test to be, able to, to be able to reach for and to be able to use. Um, it involves a direct ophthalmoscope. Many of us will already have direct ophthalmoscopes. Um, and it, it, it's very useful on children, well, not, not just children, but any patient who, who finds it difficult to communicate with you or finds it difficult to cooperate with you. So simply by um, shining the ophthalmoscope light, you can see in the image, um, I know from a child, it was just a, a person that we have uh, for, for, for the purposes of the photograph, but you can see I've got a broad beam from my direct ophthalmoscope. I'm sitting at about um, 80 to 100 centimeters. So again, I'm well back from the patient. So if they're fearful of someone getting close, this is a test you can do from 80 to 100 centimeters. Um, shine in that broad beam, look through the ophthalmoscope from that distance. It needs to be dim light, not dark, just dim and look through the ophthalmoscope um, with that broad beam illuminating um, both eyes at the same time. And what you're looking for um, through that broad beam, through your ophthalmoscope, you may need to adjust the um, focus in your ophthalmoscope to, to correctly focus on the front of the, on, on, on the eyes. You're looking at the pupil reflexes and you can see them in the same, in the same view. Um, and what you what you hope is that the, the pupil reflexes. So this is this is a test I do very early on um, after I've done the history and symptoms. If I realize there could be a communication issue or a cooperation issue, I reach for my ophthalmoscope, not to look at the retina, but to carry out this test by looking at the pupil reflexes. Um, and I'm looking for equality of brightness. Now we can see in the top image that this person does not, not have equally bright pupil reflexes. The pupil reflex, uh, sorry, the, 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 the light reflex on the right eye is much brighter than the reflex on the left eye. And that's because this person has um, a pupil anomaly. The pupil in the right eye is uh, dilated compared to the pupil in the, in the left eye. Now you might be able to see that type of pupil anomaly um, without carrying out this test, but it certainly makes it more, 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 more obvious. Um, what we can see on the image underneath is in this case, it's the right, the, sorry, the left eye that has the brighter pupil reflex and the right eye has the duller one. So the problem eye here, uh, and this is let's say very early on in the test, very little, um, having to ask the patient for anything. This is a very objective test. I can see in this person in the bottom image, there's a problem with their left eye. And that problem in this case is anisometropia. They have a much bigger refractive error in the left eye than they do in the right. Um, so remember, it's the, it's the bright eye that we're interested in. And this can give us information about small strabismus, about anisometropia, about anisocoria, media opacities, and posterior pole, so retinal abnormalities. Just through this very quick, I mean, how long does it take? Maybe 15, 20, perhaps 30 seconds to shine that light on, dial in the correct lens in the ophthalmoscope, and have a look at the equality of the, of, of, of the pupil reflexes. Now, this will not give you any refractive error information in terms of the numbers, um, it will not give you any information about the, the, the sort of the, the magnitude of the difference in any refractive error, but it will just highlight to you very early on that there's a problem. Or it, if the reflexes are equal, it will highlight to you that there isn't an 
problem asymmetry. There isn't a strabismus or unlikely to be a strabismus, unlikely to be any isom anisometropia and so forth. But what it won't do is it won't give you um, any numbers. And I find that this works well on children because um, you're sat back, it's not too dark, and they like to look at a bright light, especially if you enhance that experience by saying, I don't know, can you see the Disney princess? Can you see the famous footballer? Where I work, every, every child seems to, certainly every boy seems to know who Lionel Messi is, and every girl seems to know a Disney princess. Or so you could use Spider-Man or, or, or whatever it is in your area that would, uh, that would encourage the attention of a child. You, 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 can, you can resort um, to that. So it's a very useful introductory test. Not only does it give me confidence that I've got some useful clinical information, but it gives the patient confidence and any parents confidence, great, the child has managed to do the first test or the patient has managed to do the first test. Um, you know, absolutely wonderful. So it's a great introductory test, very quick, no expense needed if you already have a direct ophthalmoscope. Um, if you don't, then you might need to um, um, purchase one. And just one other point on this before I move on, just notice that th this contrasts with the, when we're using our retinoscopes, sometimes it's the darker reflex that gives us some concern. With the Bruckner test, it's the brighter reflex. It's asymmetry between the reflexes and it's the brighter one that is the one that we need to be looking out for. Okay, just moving on now to uh, number two, which is, you know, I, I, I like to do the very best I can for my patients. I know we all do. Um, and what they really want when they've come into my practice is they want to, if they have a vision problem, they want me to solve it for them. And if they if they have an eye disease problem, they want me to sort of, you know, perhaps bring in other professionals to help help with that. So I try my very best to get the most accurate refractive correction I can. And I do this for several reasons. I want to do the best that I can. I want to be the best that I can. Um, I want to do the best for my patients. I want them to see as well as they possibly can when they get their glasses. And I want them to tell other people what a great experience they had in my practice and how well they can see with my glasses. Because I need more and more patients to come to my practice to make the practice successful, sustainable, prosperous. We all have bills to pay. And one of the best ways to do that is for people to tell other people what a great experience they had and what great glasses they got from my practice. What a great guy that Dr. Frank is. And one way to do that is to really focus in and make sure that you've got the spot on correction for, for astigmatism. Now, we might, um, just going to switch on something here, that's it. We, we might have to think back a little bit, but the Jackson Cross Sill, is, is just, which is what I use, the handheld Jackson Cross Sill, for working out the, the astigmatic correction and the astigmatic axis. And, and these are built into phoropters as well, if you work with a phoropter, um, is that um, there, I've listed the powers there. So if you work in minus sill, when a person accepts the Jackson cross sill, this is what they're accepting. Plus 025 sphere, minus 050 um, on, 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 on the sill. So when they accept or reject, this is what they're accepting or rejecting. When they, if you're working in plus sill, then of course, it, 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 you just transpose that. But this is what they're accepting. So when they reject uh, the, the minus 050, what i thinking about is, well, they've rejected the minus 050, but maybe an extra minus 025 will be um, helpful. Maybe I can just get that circle of least confusion a bit better focused. So when they reject the minus 050, I just hold up um, a minus 025 handheld sill from the trial frame in front of their um, um, any, any sill that they've got lined up with the axis that they've got to see if they'll accept a, a little bit more, an extra minus 0025. If they accept a minus 050, but they don't accept any more, then I'll be, again, I, I'm also wondering is, well, maybe they, they've just, maybe they need a little bit less sill. So I think the bottom line to this is that I'm exploring the, when they reject 
the, any more uh, jacks and cross sill. I'm exploring any ex any little bit more minus sill. I'm exploring any any little bit more sort of more more plus sill by using handheld minus O two five and plus O two five to really fine tune that sill. My experience of when people um, before I started to use this technique, when people were coming back to me to say I can't get on with my glasses, my experience was that I'd made an error before I adopted this technique. I'd made an error, I'd either over minus the sill or under minus the sill. So I learned, well, how can I, how can I, how can I be even more accurate with my cylindrical prescriptions? I've learned to put down the Jackson cross sill when I've got to the end point of that and pick up my handheld sills and explore around that final Jackson cross sill reading with a plus 025 or minus 025 sill. And I found that uh, I got more accurate results and I got less, far less people coming back to my practice to say that they couldn't see with my glasses. And that made them happy, which made me happy and which, which helped further develop the practice. And it, it doesn't take long just to do that little extra check. And again, not something that I learned in university, didn't even learn this in, in the US from my trips there. I learned this through, through, through failure in practice with some patients. And I, I, I sat down and thought, how can I get better at this? And I, I, I worked out that some people just needed a bit more of a finer tune on their, on their, on their cross sill, on, on their astigmatic um, uh, inspection. So if someone obviously doesn't have any astigmatism, I don't do this. But if someone has any astigmatism, then I'm, I'm doing this finer tuning check. And for me, it's one of the best things I ever adopted in, uh, in, in, in practice. Uh, I'm just going to take a look at my notes. OK, right then. So I think here we've got another poll. Um, and this is about using ophthalmic drugs. So, you know, um, uh, tropicamide in particular, um, a, a drug that uh, I find of, of use, not so much for psych psychoplegia, but for pupil dilation to get a good look at the retina. But I'm very aware that in many countries, um, optometrists are either not licensed to use ophthalmic drugs at all, or they have a very, um, a very small number of drugs that they can use. Uh, again, in my experiences in the, in, in, in the Middle East, in the countries that I work, I've worked in there, they're not allowed to use, the optometrists not allowed to use any ophthalmic drugs whatsoever. So I can see it's, um, the majority is that they can use tropicamide, although it's, um, uh, it's quite a large minority um, that, that, that can't. Um, uh, and again, you know, it, it, you know I, I, I know that the legislation varies. So it's, it's, it's almost a 50-50 split. Uh, and I'm glad that many of you or over half of you work in, in, in situations where you are allowed to use this drug because it's very, very useful. Um, and the chances of a side effect are very, 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 very slight. Um, I write quite a lot about the use of tropicamide in my, one of my iTools blogs. So you can find out more there if you want to. Um, um, okay, so now there are, obviously there are areas where you can't use tropicamide. Um, what I'm going to move on to is um, uh, the use of, 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 of psychopentylate, actually. So in some areas, um, psychopentylate can't be used. Now, tropicamide, when it's 1%, does have psychoplegic effects. Um, so you can use it to, to, to get accurate refractions. Um, I prefer to use psychopentylate. Maybe we would have in the question the use of psychopentylate because it relates a bit more to this, to this, to this question. But in, in those countries where you can't use psychopentylate or tropicamide for psychoplegia, or for some patients where it's inappropriate to use those, those drugs, there are alternative techniques for controlling accommodation. Now, as refractionists, we'll know that the great enemy of the refractionist is accommodation. And that's a battle that we fight whenever we work with pre-presbyopic um, uh, patients, certainly children and teenagers and some people in their 20s even. It's accommodation that can cause us to give a misprescription and we need to control for accommodation. 
So one way to do that is to use 1% tropicamide or 1% cyclopentylate. But if you don't have access or you're not licensed or it's inappropriate um, for that um, patient, you can use this Mahindra technique, um, sometimes called near fixation retinoscopy. Um, again, um, uh, I learned this when I was working in an eye hospital. Again, it wasn't really mentioned um, in my uh, undergraduate degree. You'd be thinking, well, did they mention anything in your undergraduate degree? Well, yes, they did. They did mention some things, but I think they should have mentioned some more. Um, so controlling accommodation when either you can't use drugs or it's inappropriate um, to use drugs. And I'm just going to look at my notes just to make sure I don't miss um, anything here. So the way to do this, and this can sometimes be a problem, not always on children, in my experience, usually on children for me, but on people who can't cooperate or can't sit still or can't follow instructions, this is, uh, and they have some accommodation, this is a useful test to know about. So this one, unfortunately, has to have the room lights completely dark, very dark, almost that dark, you can't see your hand in front of your face. Now that can be quite frightening for some people, and I never just switch the lights off uh, and go pitch black into pitch black darkness. I always give some warning. I switch the main lights off. I have a side light. And once everyone's got used to that darkness, I'll switch the side light off as well. The only light that should be active is the light of your retinoscope. So this is one you, you do with a retinoscope. And I know in the photograph, uh, that person is um, presbyopic and it's a light room but I couldn't find a younger person when I made that photo. And in order for you to see what was going on, I had to have the room lights uh, up. It's difficult to photograph here. Um, so again, we're controlling. And how can we win the battle against accommodation without, without using, using drugs? Um, again, it, there are some side, some side effects of, of, of drugs. Um, and some people with neurological problems, for example, um, Down syndrome are much more likely to react to those drugs um, than, um, than than other people. Um, of course, the drugs they they the psychopentylate it stings when it goes in, um, and sometimes it can be quite a battle with the patient to get the drops in. Um, the books say that the effects last for I don't know four, five, six, seven, eight hours. In my experience, whenever I have had tropicamide or psychopentylate in my eyes the effects last for about 24 hours. So certainly with psychopentylate, I, mean, I can't read for, 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 for pretty much 20, 20 24, 24 hours. Um, so I, I don't know why that is, but, but my reaction lasts a lot longer than any textbook has, uh, has ever written about. Um, okay, so this is the alternative to using um, 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 drugs. And again, if, if you need to examine a, a the refractive error of a child on a regular basis, maybe every month or every couple of months. Again, it's going to be quite tough to be getting drops into that child to carry out the psychopentylate infection. So you may want to do one examination using psychopentylate and then subsequent examinations using this technique. So total darkness with your retinoscope working at about 50 centimetres. And you're bringing in handheld lenses, no trial frame with this one, handheld lenses, and you're holding them one by one up in front of the ret reflex to neutralize the ret reflex. The other eye has to be covered. You can use a patch. You can ask the patient to cover it if they can do that, or you can ask the carer to cover it if it's a child you're working with and the child is sat on the carer's lap. But it, you have to cover over that, that other eye. So here I am in the slide working on the patient's right eye. And I'm bringing in lenses one by one, increasing the power, reducing the power until I've neutralized the retinoscopy reflexes. And the way this gets noted is that in this example here, where I've, I've this is from a three year old patient, it took me a plus four lens to neutralize the retinoscopy movement when I was sweeping in the vertical up, up and down. And it took me a plus six lens to neutralize the retinoscopy movement when I was sweeping. Um, across ways in, in, in this direction. Um, so my raw result um, is plus four with a plus two silk, which is the difference between the lenses gives us the astigmatism. Um, and then we have the, um, the axis as well. I'm just going to move my uh, image away from that information. There we go. Uh, and the axis is at 90. 
So the, the, the power of the, of, the, of the astigmatism is in the horizontal, so the axis is at, is at, is at 90. And then we take away, so for a, a, a child that's um, um, over uh, uh, two years of age, we, we make an adjustment to the spherical element and we reduce the spherical element by minus 0. Point, by minus 0. 0.75 sphere. So we can see I've made that manipulation. We don't touch the cylindrical element. We just make that adjustment to the sphere and, and that gives us uh, some um, relief from the, the, the tonus. Uh, that will still be active in the ciliary body and allows for our, our working distance. And some good research has shown, and my personal experience has shown, that this gives, if done properly, this gives, on the right conditions, this gives results which are very similar to results from cyplegic um, fracture. So there's, there's the first example. Um, and then the next example, this is a one-year-old. Um, again, many of you, some of you won't be able to examine children of this age, but some of you can. And in this example, it took me minus five, a minus five handheld lens. I mean, I would have probably started off with a minus three and then built up to get that neutralization of the rep reflex in that up and down direction. And then it took me minus 7.5 to neutralize the reflex in this, in this, in this, this other direction. So there's the raw result. Because this child is under two, my uh, tonus and working allowance, the working distance allowance is one. So I'm, I'm adding in minus one. So the final result is minus 850 with a plus 250. Um, so that axis is 180. Of course, we do this for each eye. Um, and then the, 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 the last result, a little bit more complicated. We have some oblique astigmatism here of uh, plus one. Um, and again, this is it's simple to do in, in minus sill as well. It's, there's no issue with that. Um, I spent a lot of time working in a hospital, and in hospital, the, the standard language of refraction is in plus sills. It's to do with, to do with cataract extractions and, and stitches and so forth, but we won't go into that. So here, the raw result is plus six with a plus one cylindrical uh, power with an axis of 45. This child is older than two, uh, so we have that minus 0.75 um, allowance. And, and again, I find this works really well. Um, again, uh, I introduced this into the university curriculum where, when I started working there as a lecturer. Uh, at, so there are many optometrists now in the UK that, and not just from me, but from other people as well, who are familiar with this, this, this technique. And I would encourage you to try it. You know, if you have your own children or if there's someone in the practice that has children or, 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 or even on, 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 on the adults. If you want to practice, when I was learning these things, I often practiced on the, uh, the, the reception staff, the managers, other optometrists, um, their children, um, children of the staff, whatever, just to really get familiar and, and, and develop my skill and get proficient before I used it properly um, in practice. Okay, I'm just making sure, I think I've covered everything there. So I'm ready to go on to the, to the fourth uh, topic. Um, just put that there, wonderful. Okay, so this again is, um, um, again, not something that I learned at university, but I picked up through my own um, trial and error in, 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 in practice. When we're working in a consulting room, we're working, uh, if we have a mirror, uh, we're working at six meters, uh, some more sophisticated visual acuity systems work at three meters or even less. So we're working in an artificial environment where we're asking people to look at things <coughs> either six meters away or, or closer uh, when we do our refractive error um, uh, evaluation. Now, of course, in the real world, for many people, the real world doesn't end at six meters. I mean, if you're if you're if you're driving, um, um, you know, at high speed on a motorway, you, and you're not familiar with the with the with with where you're going, um, and your sat nav isn't, isn't isn't working, well, you don't have sat nav. Um, you need to look at the road signs, and if you wait till you get to six meters from a road sign, road sign, when you're travelling at seventy miles an hour, then you're going to miss that information. So. It's important to realize that in the real world, people have visual tasks which are far beyond six meters. Again, if you're working, uh, if you're a student, um, many of you are, and if you're sat in the, in the, in the lecture theater, um, 
you know, if you can get near the front, great. You might be at about six meters there from the from what the person is is showing you. Um, but um, in fact, that looks like my old lecture theatre. I think it might well be. Um, but um, if you are sat at the back, then you're then you you need to see beyond six meters. Um, so, and I know you can use the geochrome test, um, and I did get taught that at optometry school. You know, you 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 increase the minus or you decrease the plus to get them on the green. What I found was certainly with um, youngsters and teenagers is that the, when I tried to get them on the green and um, by by increasing the minus, they just accommodated and it was still equal or it was on the red. And I found I was um, over uh, over minusing them. Um, and then they came back and complained that my glasses were giving them giving them headaches, or I was uh, underminusing them when I was using the geochrome, um, and um, and they couldn't see in the distance because I was setting them to be equal on the red and the green, and that means they were set for six six meters. Now some people, this lady here, I've got an image of, they might not have a distance task, so for them. Um, uh, setting them for six meters or closer will probably be fine if if they're reading and 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 and, and working at home where they don't need to see things far away. Then 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 setting them for six meters is 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 fine. Um, but but you need to remember that most people, many people that you will see, um, will have a visual task that requires seeing clearly beyond six meters. Again, children. Um, working in the classroom, they don't need to see beyond six, six, six metres. That's probably enough. When they get to be older, then, then, then that's different. But the point I'm making here is I don't use the duochrome. What I do is that I've got my final prescription set to six metres. I've worked it out. I'm not a big fan of the duochrome test. If you use it, great, but it's not for me. And then before I issue the final prescription, I will add an extra minus 025 to the distance prescription. Uh, it, uh, it, it, if it's a if it's a minus prescription, or if it's a plus prescription, I'll reduce it by plus a two five, and that sets them beyond six meters. And if I'm working with someone that drives for a living, was regularly on the motorway, I may even use a, a minus o fifty adjustment to give them an extra minus o fifty, or reduce the plus by by o fifty. So I'm taking into account that they need to see beyond six meters. And I'm making an adjustment, and I write it clearly in my notes. Here is the um, the final subjective prescription, and here is the prescription I'm going to recommend. Because in many patients, there is a difference between the subjective prescription that you find in the consulting room and what they actually need in the real world. So what I'm giving them, where appropriate, is a real world prescription rather than a consulting room prescription. Uh, and I remember once I was asked to um, mentor another optometrist because they were having so many rechecks. There were so many people coming back um, complaining of not being able to see in the distance with their glasses. And what we worked out was that this person was working, I think they had a four meter test, a four meter visual acuity chart, and they were setting everyone to see clearly at four meters. And when I sat with them and looked at what they did uh, and saw that they were setting them for, a, work, for, a, for a, 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 a working visual task of four meters, um, and they weren't making any adjustment and they weren't using geochrome, I quickly realized the source of those visual complaints. And this person just had no idea. They'd never thought. They just set them for four meters and that was the prescription they issued. Um, and that's what the patient um, got. And then they came back to say, I can't see on the motorway. I can't see TV. I can't see the cinema screen. I can't see from the back of the lecture theatre. So we quickly identified the problem, had some tutoring, and, and uh, the person realised what was going wrong. And, and we solved the, solved, the, solved the problem. OK, so have a think about that when you're in, in practice. OK. Um, and now just coming up to the, the fifth, uh, doesn't time fly when you're having, having fun? The fifth and final one, and I think we're coming to the fourth and final poll. Um, thank you for contributing to the poll so far. It's very useful. This one is about, are you licensed to conduct 
examination of the of of the retina. So about two thirds, nearly exactly two thirds, um, are licensed to to look at the retina, and and many aren't. So again, what I would suggest is get yourselves educated, learn how if you're not licensed, learn how to do these things, get some certificates, get some diplomas. Uh, get trained by ophthalmologists or, 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 you know, optometrists and tell your legislators, we can do this. Here are our qualifications. Here's our education. We can look at the retina. We can, we can let, we can let the, the specialists that work in hospitals take care of the special and rare cases. And we can look at the, uh, we can case find in, in, in practice. Okay, enough from, enough from me on the education and legislation. And um, here is, again, a technique that um, uh, I, I can't remember where I first came across this. Certainly it wasn't in my um, undergraduate optometry program. It was a wonderful program. The lecturers were great. I had some fantastic experiences, great friends, who I'm still friendly with. Um, there were some gaps in my, in my education and, uh, and I filled um, many of those gaps. And here's another gap filling piece of uh, or technique modified monocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. Now, this can work without a dilated pupil, but it works much, much, much better with a dilated pupil. So this is where I, I, I would be using trypicamide, uh, usually trypicamide 1% get a dilated, uh, a dilated pupil. Now, um, there are head-mounted versions uh, of, of this, which are very expensive. Um, and quite difficult to use, I think. What I'm talking about here with the modified monocular indirect is a direct ophthalmoscope and an indirect lens. So I'm holding the lens in front of the dilated pupil and I'm looking at the image that that lens creates. The lens creates an image between me and the lens, between the practitioner and the lens, and I'm looking at that image with a direct ophthalmoscope, and I've got one, got one here. Now, I find this particularly useful on, 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 on children um, wh where I've dilated them, or maybe I've done a cyclegic refraction and the pupil's nice and big, because when I look in their eye just with my direct ophthalmoscope, when I get up close, and that can sometimes be a problem, and I'm looking in the pupil, the dilated pupil, just with my direct ophthalmoscope. I'm up close and I'm one centimetre away. And they're comfortable with that, but they like to look at my light. So I get a great view of the fovea. I get a great view of the macula. But in many cases, I just simply could not get a view of the optic nerve head, the disc, because they were fixating. They were looking at my light. What's in the light? You said before there was something interesting in the light. What's in the light? And no matter what I have asked them to do, to look in the distance, to get their parents to sit across the room and wave at them, they I can't see the optic nerve head with my normal direct ophthalmoscope. But with this technique, using an indirect lens and my direct ophthalmoscope, and I'm sat back at about 18 centimetres, um, and again, for children who are nervous or adults who are nervous, that's great because you're, you're not right in their face. Uh, you don't need a slit lamp for this, which uh, can be expensive. You sat back with your direct ophthalmoscope, focusing on the image that that indirect lens uses. And I tend to use a, a 20 diopter condensing lens. So this is the type of lens that's used with a head mounted system, um, but I'm using it with my direct ophthalmoscope. Now this doesn't give me any 3D because I'm just using one eye, but it does give me a reasonable magnification and a better field of view than when I'm looking just with my direct, when I'm very up close using just my direct. So I can see, in most cases, I can see the macula, the fovea, and the optic nerve head all in one view. I wanna make sure there's no optic nerve head disease that, 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 I, I, you know, that I, I, I might miss. So it's moderately magnified, gives enough magnification. It's not as much as when I'm just using my direct ophthalmoscope, but it's enough, but it's the wider field of view that really, really helps me. And if I spot something of interest, then I can try and look with my, just with my direct um, um, to further investigate if need be. 
the condensing lens is held out um, two to three, two to sorry, three to five centimeters in front of the eye. I'm shining my ophthalmoscope through the lens, through the dilated pupil. I might need to focus my um, ophthalmoscope to get um, a sharp image, um, but, but this, this works really well. The downside, the image is like with any indirect technique, the image is upside down and back to front. So we need to, we need to remember that and we need to think, okay, I can see a lesion here. That means it's the, it's the, have to flip it up, flip it the right way around and flip it the, the right way around this way. So that can be tricky and I struggle with that. Um, but the, the, the image is upside down and, and back to front. And the magnification is about four to five times with uh, an ophthalmoscope on an emetrope, it's about 15 times. And it'll be just, just that field of view that really, 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 really helps, helps me. Um, uh, a, 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 again, um, you can, you can um, uh, get closer or you can move further back to enhance your view of that, of that image, a little bit rock, uh, rocking backwards and forwards. But I find about 18 centimetres away from the patient with the right lens focused in will give me um, a, a, a really good image. Now, I'm not saying that this is for every patient. I'm not saying the Bruckner test is for every patient. I'm not saying um, the, you, you know, the Mahindra is for every patient. I'm not saying this, but it's useful to know about these things, useful perhaps to explore these things, try these things out, test them on um, people in the practice, <coughs> and your, 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 your family. Um, uh, and, you know, get, get a sense of how these work. And then when you, you come across a patient, you think, oh, I really, I need to control for the accommodation. Um, I can't use drugs. The Mahindra technique, yeah, I know how to do that. Or I just can't get a view of this person's optic disc because they keep looking at my ophthalmoscope. Ah, modified mon monocular indirect. I know how to do that. You know, I'm a great believer in learning new things, trying new things and every day, trying to get that little bit better for my own personal benefit, but also the people that I'm working with, uh, and particularly when they're uh, vulnerable people like many of my patients. Okay, I've gone through my techniques. Um, my last slide is just to, um, I can get there. There we go. Uh, I've written a couple of books. Again, they're written in a, in a, in a, in a very straightforward Every day, you know, these are these are these are hopeful. I always try my best to give information to help people develop knowledge that they can use in practice, and that's what these books are about. Written in a way that you can read something in one of my books or listen to something that I say, and then you can go into practice. And maybe with a little bit of testing on on on, on some of the staff, you can use those things in practice. I'm, I'm I, I don't waste my time and your time by talking about things that are not useful in practice. I try my very best to help people get better so they can do a great job with their patients, so they can have successful careers and successful and pro prosperous practices. That's what makes me happy. Thank you. I'm all done. Over to Fakhruddin and we can have a look at some questions. Great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Frank. I think uh, really important, this test, uh, the modified test, what I would like to put it as. And uh, some of the techniques, what you just shared, are really, uh, I think, the need of the hour, if I may put it that way, because uh, the, the last one, direct ophthalmoscope used to see the fundus. Now, because of the COVID, we are not going close to the patient. I think doing doing the modified version would probably give us a better idea if we don't have a uh, fundus photography or fundus uh, camera in our practice. I think just by looking at a 20D lens, we are quite uh, far from the patient and it's much more easier for us to see, right? That That's an excellent point and that hadn't occurred to me. So thank you. So that's another learning thing for, for, for me today. Thank you very much. And also the iTools, uh, which is a platform where you can... Uh, you know, develop or learn some skills. Uh, probably, Dr. Frank, you would like to share a bit of background on on the iTools, if you may. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, uh, I think um, when we when we set up this uh, this this presentation, um, I gave you some information about the community that had developed through the iTools platform. 
it was, it was just over 400 or so. Now we're, we're nearly at 700. So we have, we have this community of, of not just optometrists, but opticians, ophthalmologists who have joined iTools, signed up for iTools. Um, and they're from uh, 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 India, Malaysia, Singapore, Zambia, Mozambique, Cuba, uh, Egypt, Libya, uh, or, or Dubai, from everywhere. And what they, what they have access to is my 30 years of experience as working as, a, working as a, an eye clinician and also as an educator. So I, I write every day there's a question of the day. So I pose a clinical question um, and, and I answer it and people contribute to, 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 my, to my response. Um, I talk about, um, there's, there's a thing called one minute read where I, I, I try my best to explain technology uh, in words that would take about a minute to read. One of the very popular ones is cross-linking for keratoconus treatment. So I break it down into, um, not to be patronizing, but you know, everyone's busy, everyone's in a hurry, everyone's got lots to do. So I break it down into simple, quick information that gives people a good understanding of, uh, of what that technology is. I'm working on one for OCT. Um, and I, I also have um, slightly longer articles called um, iTools journal articles, where, uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm talking about handling difficult cases, clinical decision making, but also things about how to look after yourself, how to look after your mental state, your well-being, and also how to look after the happiness of the practice staff. Um, so it's not all about clinical decision making and, and, and um, clinical things. Some of what I write is about how to make sure you're feeling good about, about the world and about yourself and how to encourage your patients, not your patients, your staff to be happy. Because in my experience, if, if you're happy about things and your staff are happy about things, then everything else falls into ni nicely into, in, in, into place. So it's, the, the, and there are also lots of videos on there as well. So videos for the um, um, uh, Mahindra technique and, and, and other techniques and tonometry techniques and other, so there's a whole raft of videos, binocular vision videos. We have hundreds of videos and webinars that people can, can gain access to. Much of it is free, but for the webinars and some of the more other advanced things, there is a, there's a small subscription just so we can keep things, keep things go, going. But uh, click on there, go there. You don't have to sign up. You can, you can see what we've got available. If you want to sign up, you can for the free elements and there's plenty of stuff where there's no charge. But for the premium elements, the webinars and, and, and things which take some, uh, there's some cost to those, um, there, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is a fee. But every day there are more and more people sign up and so we're up to 700 people now. And the oh, thing I love like about it most is when people contribute and they say, yeah, Frank, you, you, your experience is that, but my experience is this. And that always adds to the knowledge base and that community feel. So people from Zambia can learn from people in India. People in Cuba can learn from people in Dubai. I, I, I think that's great. Yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you for creating that platform, actually. And uh, yeah, some of the videos which I had uh, the chance to watch are really interesting. And it really explains you in detail. And I, the, the video quality is, is really nice. I would, I would comment on that as well. Because when you have a video, the video quality, if it's shaky, if it's not good, I think all these precision have also been taken care when you have developed the iTools, I guess. Yes, thank you. Um, I work alongside a, a, a video production person who's fantastic with camera work and setting everything up. So it's a really good partnership. I provide the experience and the content about eyes and it, he makes it all look great, Yeah, which is very important. That's right. Great. Okay, so I'm just, okay great. So there's one question which has just popped up. Uh, it's like any recommendation of the direct ophthalmoscope because there were two tests where, you know, you, you briefed us about using the direct ophthalmoscope. Uh, there's a question asking, is there any direct ophthalmoscope recommendations, uh, what you would like to give, in particularly the brand probably, or something where we want to invest on this particular instrument, what should we, uh, you know, look or take into account if we were to invest on a direct ophthalmoscope? What a, what, a, what a great question. Um, uh, I, I myself use um, a, a Heine 
Uh, it's a German brand. Uh, H E I N E, a Heine Beta 200 ophthalmoscope. Um, and uh, you know, it's German build quality. I've had it for a long time. In fact, um, I bought one set um, and then I needed to, for, for practicality reasons, I needed another set. Um, so I'd had the first set for about five years uh, and it was still working fine. Um, but I liked it so much, I bought another set, exactly the same. And that says, you know, that, that's, that's good repeat business. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of choice. So I use a Heine Beta 200 ophthalmoscope. Um, it, I find it, it's good build quality. The lenses are great. And the price is reasonable because you can get some very, very expensive um, direct ophthalmoscopes. Um, and is there a other type of direct in the World Sight Foundation that sh show me which is ten pounds only? Well, um, great. Um, ten pounds is a very low cost for an. I've just read that question. Is there any yeah. other type of direct ophthalmoscope in the UK? World Sight Foundation of UK Optom show me which is ten pounds only. Um, wow, that's a very low cost. Um, I don't know about that ophthalmoscope. Um, my, the, the, the one I'm talking about, the Heine, the German one, and there are other brands, but I find that that's a great, um, uh, uh, you're, you're welcome, Priyanka, I'm glad you, I'm glad you liked it. Um, yeah. that, that I, I don't know, I don't want to be disparaging of this one for £10 only, and maybe it's like a massive discount and someone is subs subsidising it, I, I don't know, I'd have to have a look at that, and when, when we're finished, I will go away and have a look at that. Um, I can't comment on that one. I can comment on my Heine. Um, that's a reasonable price, more than ten pounds though. But it's such build quality. I've taken it all over the world, dropped it here, there, and everywhere, and my Heine still works. And if I needed to buy another one, I'd buy the same same yeah. one. But I'll have to have a look at that one for ten pounds. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that that sounds interesting, and uh, I. I think those probably are for the field works, I guess, for the field work or for uh, for doing the eye screening camps, which probably might have one magnification and a bright source of light to just look at the functionality, whether the retina is good or not. Maybe it's that yeah. that's the one. Yeah, it, it must be quite a, a simple device yeah. With, yeah. with 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 not many um, sort of attributes, as it as it as it were. Functionality must be quite low. Great, great, yeah, yeah. And, and to add on to that, I also have used a Heine before when I was studying my undergraduate, not very long ago, but about 10 years back. And uh, I also like the Keeler one. I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at that, but the Keeler one is also uh, something to look at. It, it gives a quite a good amount of handling and uh, the options of brightness and all that are quite nice in that as well. Uh, I, I agree. I, my... my uh... I decided against the, 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 the Keeler one when I was choosing because um, I think the Keeler one was a little bit more expensive. But when I was in, um, when I was in Ghana, uh, just very briefly, uh, we were doing some work in Ghana and uh, there was a, an optometrist in, the, in, the, in the, um, the van ahead of me and the, the, the door of that van burst open as we were moving and his ophthalmoscope and his retinoscope fell out onto the road and the van I was in drove over it. And that, that was Keeler, and it survived. The case was smashed, but actually the, the ophthalmoscope and the retinoscope both survived that, that, that incident. And he was yeah. very pleased because they're expensive. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it, it's, it's a bit pricey. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree to that. And uh, the next question, let's take the second question. Any suggestions in terms of performing retinoscopy in patients? Having dull glow due to any media opacity or cataract. Any tips on on performing retinoscopy for these kind of patients? Excellent question. Yep, yeah, yeah. And in my travels, I've come across uh, a lot of cases like like this. So I would say, firstly, um, if you're using a um, a battery powered retinoscope, make sure you've got you know the, the, if it's rechargeable, make sure it's fully charged. If the batteries are a few weeks old. And get have some fresh batteries uh, ready um and the other thing to do is to uh, sorry 60 not 50 centimeters 66 centimeters 67 centimeters sort of arm's length work closer move in closer but then 
when you're making your um, adjustment for your working distance, um, instead of use, you know, you, you have to bear in mind if you're working at 50 centimeters with your standard retinoscopy to get closer to make the light brighter, you have to take into account um, the working distance of 50 centimeters. If you're working at 25 centimeters, you have to take the, that working distance into account when you're making your final, um, you know, you're writing that final prescription. So good batteries or highly charged batteries and um, get closer and maybe even, you know, have the room lights down even a bit more to, to try and improve the quality of that, of, 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 of that reflex. And, and if that doesn't work, um, then you, you, I guess you have to rely more on your subjective refraction. And if there's issues with communication, then that makes it very difficult. Um, I often rely on my retinoscopy when there's a communication issue, but if the reflex is dull, um, I try my very best. Um, but if, if I can't get an objective or a subjective value, it's really, it's really challenging to come up with a description. That's right. Okay. And one more question is, you did mention about adjusting the refractive error in terms of the habitual requirement of the patient. So, you know, this is a kind of a connecting question with that for, for office workers who probably don't need a six meter clear vision. Would you suggest to lower the grade uh, to make it much easier for them to see at intermediate and reading tasks, which they would normally want to perform? Yeah, excellent question. Really like this. Well, I like them all, but I like this one as well. Um, so this is where you have to explore. Uh, so you you found out that they're an office worker. OK, now, in, in my experience, office workers tend to be working at a screen that's fairly, fairly close. But I've come across office workers who've, who've so I've, I've given them screen glasses, we'll call them, the prescription for a screen lens. And they come back to me to say, Frank, what I didn't mention when I was here last time is that every hour I need to look across the office at a big monitor to take some information from that big monitor and use that information. And with the glasses you've given me, I can't see that big monitor across the, across the office. So if they are just working in an office where everything is desk-based, and they do not need to look across the, the office, fine. You, you, you give them the prescription for, for, their, for their desk environment. But also make sure that then they don't need to then get into their car when they're driving home with those glasses. So it might well be that you're recommending some desk glasses with, a, with, with less minus or more plus, and then maybe another prescription for home driving or cinema or TV. And it may well be that the people who don't want to have two pairs of glasses, that you then have like a compromise prescription that will give them reasonable desk office vision and you know pretty good driving um, home vision. But just be careful, if you're setting your prescription for the desk and the screen, they may come back and say, with these glasses, I can't see you when I'm driving home. Good yeah. question. Yeah. yeah. And I think the, the importance of uh, asking them the screen size and the distance also probably pay, plays a very important role, as you mentioned. Uh, yes. Look into what are they using, right? And, and accordingly adjust your prescription. Absolutely, yeah. You can, get a, you can show, ask them to um, tell you how far the screen is. Do they need to use, do they use a phone? Do they use a, a laptop, which tends to be closer? Are they using a big monitor, which tends to be further away? So there's some further exploration, further questioning that you need before you can um, give the advice of which type of prescription to go for. That's right. Yeah, because and, and the occupation as well, because I remember one case of a musician who came to me and, you know, they, they really look at the iPad and they want to have the prescription for that particular distance and they are piano uh, they are playing the piano so their distance is not the computer distance is about 1 meter from their uh, you know uh, yeah. from their viewing so so again that that's really important for us to explore and and look onto the patient requirement correctly said. absolutely absolutely thank you for that yeah great and one last question before we you know end for today What's your take on full prescription in terms of hypermetropia? Should we be prescribing full prescriptions or should we adjust the prescription for hypermetropia? 
and the same for myopia any any comments on that in terms of just the prescription oh, uh, okay so so i'm a great believer in providing the sharpest possible image i can on 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 the retina sharpest possible image now um if i'm giving someone a little bit of extra minus so they can see the road signs taking into account my 6 meter uh consulting room um i i'm also checking to make sure that they can accommodate so when they're looking at something close so i I'm, i'm i'm not I, i i do manipulate prescriptions to take into account um working distance and office and driving and so forth um but but i see less in myopia yeah i i'm not a big fan of undercorrecting myopia so there's a theory i i understand the question now so there's a theory i i think that if you undercorrect a myopia that in some way protects them from progression of their myopia um uh i, I was just listening to a webinar just uh, earlier in the week where um there's some research to show that undercorrecting people with myopia um will um cause their my- myopic progression to be even faster so um um and, and again the same with hypermetropia so so uh, i don't undercorrect people who are myopic to slow down their myopic progression and i i don't uh i don't manipulate my hypermetropic prescription again to manipulate myopic progression um Dr. Rudin we we both know that in in the world of contact lenses there are some great lenses now that can help with myopic progression there are also some spectacle lenses which can help with myopic progression um I I I'm very interested in the some of the contact lenses I think they've got a great future but I don't manipulate my prescription with the lenses uh in order to reduce the progression of of of, of myopia Yeah and I think absolutely right as many of speakers on our platform has already mentioned this as well that you know uh, undercorrecting is never a good way to you know uh, take into account myopic progression patient because that actually triggers myopic progression so it the yeah. theory is already out and uh, we shouldn't be doing that that's absolutely, absolutely. totally agree thank you thank you Okay so I think uh, we have taken almost all questions just let me have a quick look at the chat and I think uh, yep we did we did take all the questions thank you very much dr frank for you know introducing us to these uh, five techniques i think out of the five techniques for me personally three of them were quite new uh, you know uh, brookness test is something which we have learned in 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 optometry school Uh, probably because i am just 10 years old graduate uh, that would probably that's that's why i learned it uh, but but the last one quite interestingly to use uh, indirect handheld lens and using a direct ophthalmoscope uh, that's 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 really a wonderful technique which i would definitely start looking up to and start practicing uh, from now on that's great that makes me feel very happy thank you yeah most welcome most welcome and so uh, thank you everyone Thanks for setting this up. I've very much enjoyed it and thank you everyone who who has listened. Hopefully this will make a, a an impact on your your clinical work um and uh, thank you for all the wonderful questions. It's really given me something to think about and thank you for all the the things that I've learned today. You're most welcome. So to the attendees, uh, I am just taking the slide to the next one. Great. So we do have a case presentation series lined up and we are preparing for it and i would request if you have any interesting cases or if you have tried any of dr frank's techniques uh, in your practice please do share with us that would be a platform for you to share uh, your experience if you have tried and you know if you got to detect some ocular disease or some ocular pathology with using some of the techniques what you have learned today please put in the small abstract and you can uh, you know we can schedule your presentation and you can present your interesting cases onto our platform we do have sessions planned for next week uh, one of it is on glaucoma uh, uh, in terms of uh, case presentation series on glaucoma 
and the other one is on contact lenses, scleral contact lenses to be more precise. So thank you everyone for joining in today. Thank you, Dr. Frank, once again for giving us your time. It was a Sunday afternoon. Very glad that you could give us uh, family time and you know, okay. Sunday weekend is a family time, right? Uh, thank you so much for doing that. And I see the chat filled up with a lot of thank yous. And I, I, I'm sure that uh, many people have learned from today's session. Thank you very much. It's been a, it's been absolutely d delightful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Uh, enjoy the festive season for those who are celebrating Diwali or Deepavali. Uh, continue enjoying it and celebrating it. I think the Deepavali festival, specifically in India, goes for about five days. Uh, so, so if today I think it's the second or the third day where people would still be in the festive mood. So enjoy your festive seasons. I will see you all again next week. Take care, be safe, and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye-bye for now.